All right, hello, hello everyone, and welcome to what will end up being lesson three of area of study 2A. You would have been through economic activity and then the five sector circular flow model, which had a little bit of aggregate demand, which flows nicely on into this third part, which is all about aggregate demand as an influence on Australia's cyclical level of economic activity, which is a really, really long title, which I'd really just recommend to be aggregate demand, or as the VCAR study design points out, aggregate demand and its components. So in the next like 11 slides of information, we're gonna go through each part of aggregate demand. So consumption spending, private investment spending, government spending, exports and imports, and how they impact the overall level of economic activity. This is really, really important because how you talk about aggregate demand and its components really influences the structure of your answers for every topic from here on in, in VC economics. So this is paramount to doing well in VC economics. So straight up, firstly, aggregate demand to define it very, very quickly. Aggregate demand represents the sum of spending on goods and services produced in a nation over a year. It's also sometimes referred to as the total level of expenditure on all goods and services by a nation over a year, whichever you prefer to use, they are both totally fine. And it's made up of C plus I plus G plus X minus M. You need to know that equation. That equation will come in handy for you. Sometimes it will come in handy as a multiple choice question where you get given the value of all of them and need to work out the total value of aggregate demand. So now how rising aggregate demand causes economic activity to expand. So you would have seen from when you were doing the circular flow model, um, down the bottom we have the leakages and injections. So we've got for leakages, private savings, tax revenue and imports. And then for injections, we've got private investment spending, government spending and exports. When injections outweigh leakages, firms tend to see growing sales because it, it means more money is coming into the economy from outside sectors be it businesses, governments, or our overseas training partners. And that means that there's more demand for all goods and services in the country. So businesses then have to respond by increasing their output, providing that there's productive capacity available. So um, in this case, increasing their output, when businesses know that there is gonna be more sales, because say for example, say for example, if there was an increase in economic activity in China, China is our biggest trading partner. Therefore, when China starts speeding up in their economy, we know we are gonna start getting more demand for our exports. And if we have productive capacity available, that means that we will be able to um, increase production and increase our economic activity to match that. If there's no unused productive capacity, this rising aggregate demand leads to widespread shortages of goods and services, which can then lead to what we call demand inflation, which is typically found in booms. It's kind of happened a little bit during the mining boom. Now, inflation's so low that you wouldn't really think about it we're kind of averaging around like 1% or under it these days. But demand inflation tends to be when we are beyond the two to 3% goal, which we'll talk about more in future. Um, so usually when we're above three, we're gonna call that demand inflation because prices tend to be moving at a rate faster than the economy can keep up with. And that's happening because there are some widespread shortages and people are bidding up prices. So when aggregate demand slows down, that causes economic activity to contract. So when leakages outweigh the injections, in the economy, production begins to slow. So when leakages start to rise, so people are saving more, the government's taking more tax, or we are importing more because the Australian dollar is too high in value, production begins to slow down because businesses see less demand for their production, which means they start to lay off workers, um, downsize, all those kind of things. And if this happens over a long period of time, it can lead to a recession, which is when we have negative GDP growth in two consecutive quarters, or a depression if it's incredibly severe, but we haven't seen that in a long time, although it would be the closest we have been. So slowdowns often lead to high levels of unemployment, like we just said, and lower inflation as firms should cut their prices to clear out excess stock. Then to keep going, um, how aggregate demand can create ideal levels of economic stability. So through the government's use of various policies, they try to slow or speed up aggregate demand so the country can enjoy the benefits of domestic economic stability. So we've got things like the government alters things like the tax rates because that can very quickly impact the amount of income we have. So if they increase tax rates, that's gonna to lead to us doing less private consumption spending, which is gonna lower aggregate demand and therefore help slow things down if we are in a boom or recession. If they wanna speed up spending, they can just do the opposite, decrease tax. It's gonna to lead to increased consumption spending and increased aggregate demand. So the government tries to manipulate things to make sure that we are at the right level of economic activity, which is going to maximize society's kind of outcomes. 
So components of aggregate demand and their demand side determinants. So when we talk about aggregate demand side factors, it's really similar to when we talked about demand factors, but they are more general to all spending. So they're the influences that determine the cyclical level of spending or aggregate demand or um, overall economic activity. So things like consumer confidence, business confidence, exchange rates, tax rates, interest rates, all these things, anything that could um, impact spending overall as a whole. So to get into each of the components one by one. So private consumption, this is all about household expenditure, which is designed of us spending to satisfy our needs and wants for durable and single use goods, as well as services such as food, clothing, rent, transport, power, entertainment, and childcare. It's all just our general spending that we do. Uh, it represents about 60% of aggregate demand. So about 60% overall. So it's the largest component of aggregate demand that we look at. So it's affected by things like consumer confidence, disposable income, interest rates, tax rates, and population growth. Um, so you could probably guess if consumers are feeling confident, they're gonna spend more. If they've got more disposable income, they'll spend more. If interest rates are too high, they won't spend because they'll save instead, because there's a reward for saving. Tax rates we just talked about. Population growth, as the population goes up, it means there's gonna be more spending because there's more people. Then private investment. So this is all about private business capital spending on physical plant, manufactured materials and equipment used to make other goods and services. So this is all about businesses injecting more money into the economy as they invest in plant and equipment because they want to be able to increase their productive capacity. So this improves our productive capacity. So we want businesses to be conducting investment spending. It represents less than 22% of aggregate demand. This responds to changes in business confidence. So as business confidence increases, it will increase aggregate demand as businesses invest more. Interest rates, if they're low, businesses will invest more. If they're high, businesses won't. And company tax rates. So if company tax rates are low, businesses will spend more overall. So this is the component of aggregate demand which fluctuates the most, which also sometimes gets called to, referred to as being the most volatile part of aggregate demand. And that's because it's affected by things like interest rates, etc. Businesses um, really, really react strongly to the level of interest rates and that will impact their level of investment overall. Um, the reason why I've highlighted that point is that it came up in a multiple choice question once and tends to be asked here and there in terms of what's the most... Yeah, questions like what's the largest component of aggregate demand, which component fluctuates the most, important to know things like that. Then we've got government spending, G1, which is public expenditure to satisfy society's needs and wants. This includes wages paid to government departments and all defence spending. It's around 17% of aggregate demand. So my wages are a part of G1, government consumption spending, as I'm a teacher and I get money from the government for that. Um, it's affected by election promises, population growth, the budget outcome, and the economic conditions at the time. Um, so just in general, um, with population growth, the more population there is, the more the government's probably gonna need to spend on like social services and all those kind of things, um, whether they're promising teachers and public servants increased wages, that's gonna affect the amount of government consumption spending. But then the easier way to talk about government spending and government investment is G2 spending, which is public expenditure on capital equipment such as buildings, roads, railways, water um, supplies. So this is the kind of stuff that people tend to talk about. So this is when you're talking about infrastructure projects. So my go-to is always talking about the Westgate Tunnel and that it's really clear how that money is going into the economy, how it's being injected in and the impact it would have, why that would lead to more aggregate demand. Because if you spend on an infrastructure project, creates employment, which then creates more income, creates more spending, more aggregate demand, and just the cost of it directly creates more demand overall. So it's used to satisfy society's wants and expand our productive capacity. So the reason why we build more roads, more tunnels, etc., is so we can be more efficient, but it's only actually around 3% of aggregate demand. So it's relatively small compared to the others. This can be influenced by voter expectations, election promises, population growth, and the availability of government revenue. So if there's not a lot of government revenue available, there's probably not gonna be as many infrastructure projects. Or you'll see like at the moment, because we're in a slowdown because of COVID uh, and the whole pandemic, a lot of infrastructure projects have been pushed forward to try and stimulate the economy more to help us recover from that overall. And lastly, we've got net exports. So um, the balance of our imports against our exports, imports are a leakage because that's money leaving our economy and going to other economies as we import products from there. Exports are money coming into the economy as people buy our goods and services from overseas. 
So the percentage of average demand greatly varies as it's based on changing demand side factors such as overseas conditions, like we talked about with China before. The exchange rate, so a high exchange rate means that we are gonna import more and export less. And a low exchange rate means we're gonna import less because it's more expensive and we're gonna export a lot more because it's cheaper. The terms of trade, which is kind of like an overall ratio of the value of our exports compared to our imports, which we'll get into a lot more in area study three, for the time being, you just need to know that it is a demand side factor. And if it is high, it is good. If it's low, it is bad. Consumer confidence, when we're confident, we probably tend to import more. Business confidence, um, imports can affect, or the value of the Australian dollar can impact businesses a lot. For example, a low Australian dollar will make businesses more confident as they're more confidently able to export their goods and services. Tariffs, which are taxes on imports and exports, obviously gonna affect the demand for them interest rates, taxes, and budget outlays. And that's essentially it for aggregate demand and all the components of it and the things that affect them. Um, this is gonna be really clear. So like one massive tip in terms of when you get any question about aggregate demand is that it'll be like explain how blank impacts aggregate demand and then maybe one of the domestic macroeconomic goals. What you need to do is kind of explain the factor, say what it impacts directly of aggregate demand. So for example, like, a decrease in um, personal income tax means that households are gonna have more disposable income. This is likely to lend increase their private consumption spending, which will lead to an increase in aggregate demand. And that kind of creates your structure for all your answers going forward. Um, that's essentially it for this. So if you have any questions at all, feel free to comment below, send me an email, all those kind of things. As always, there are links to like my website and Discord below if you want to ask any more questions or check out anything else economics related. On that, I hope you have a wonderful day. Goodbye.